Hi, everyone. I'm Lynn Clark, and I make code cartoons. And I also work at Mozilla on things like WebAssembly, which I gave a talk about last year here at JSConfU. In fact, that was what was featured on there. And this talk is about WebAssembly, too. But this is a different kind of talk from last year's talk. I think you've all probably seen this structure by now. It's kind of hard to miss right in the middle there. But you may have wondered what it was doing. It's playing animations created by all of you. But why? Why did we want to do this? Well, one of the hardest problems when you're learning a new programming language is figuring out a project that you can work on, one that will teach you the basics of the programming language, but still keep you interested enough to keep learning more. Because there are only so many times that you can implement Hello World in a new language and have it be interesting at all. Because your Hello World has no real world impact. But what if your Hello World could have an impact on the real world? What if your Hello World could control a structure like this one? And that's exactly what you can do. Your Hello World can play a light animation on the space out there. Now, some of these animations are made with JavaScript. And if you're here, you might not be too interested in a JavaScript Hello World. But some of the animations are made in a language that you may be interested in learning. And that's Rust compiled to WebAssembly. So you'll be coming away from JS ConfU with lots of new friends and lots of new experiences. And I hope that one of those new experiences is your first Rust module compiled to WebAssembly. So let's get started on baby's first Rust to WebAssembly module. And this is kind of the perfect project for that, not because this is the kind of project that you would usually use WebAssembly for. People use WebAssembly because they want to supercharge their application and make it run faster, or because they want to use the same code on the web and other platforms. This project doesn't do either of those. We create these animations ahead of time, so we don't care about having consistent high performance. And we don't need to run on any other devices, so we don't need it to be portable. The reason that this is a good project for getting started with WebAssembly is not because this is what you'd usually use WebAssembly for. Instead, it's because it's really useful in giving you a mental model of how JavaScript and WebAssembly work together. So let's take a look at what we need to do to take control of this space with WebAssembly. And then I'll explain what makes it a good mental model for how WebAssembly and JavaScript work together. What we have here is a three-dimensional space. And really, if you think about it, it's actually a four-dimensional space, because we're going through time as well. The computer can't think in these four dimensions, though. So how do we make these four dimensions make sense to the computer? Let's start with the fourth dimension and collapse down from there. You're probably familiar with the way that we make time, the fourth dimension, make sense to computers. That's by using these things called frames. On the web, we talk about having 60 frames per second. That's what you need to have smooth animations across the screen. What that really means is that you have 60 different snapshots of the screen, of what the animation should look like at 60 different moments in that second. It's kind of like a flipbook. And each frame is like a page in that flipbook. In our case, the snapshot is a snapshot of what the lights on the space should look like. And our frame rate for that is 35 frames per second. So that brings us down to a sequence of snapshots of the space, a sequence of 3D representations of the space. Now we want to go from 3D to 2D. And in this case, it's pretty easy. All we need to do is take the space and flatten it out into basically a big sheet of graph paper. So now we're down to 2D. We just need to collapse this one more time. The way we can do that is by taking each row and putting that row next to the previous row. So now we're down to this line of pixels. And we can put this in memory, because memory is basically just a line of boxes. So this means that we've gotten it down to a one-dimensional representation. We still have all of the data that we had in the two or the three or the four-dimensional representation of this space. It's just being represented in a different way. It's being represented as a line. 
The reason that this is a good mental model for how WebAssembly and JavaScript work together is because one of the main ways to communicate between WebAssembly and JavaScript at the moment is through something called linear memory. It's basically a line of memory that you use to represent things. The WebAssembly module and the JavaScript that's running that module both have access to this object through a JavaScript object called an array buffer. And this is just an array of bytes, and bytes are just numbers. So to make this animation happen, JavaScript tells the WebAssembly module, OK, fill in the animation now. And it does this by calling a method or a function on the WebAssembly module. WebAssembly will go and fill in all of the numbers for each pixel in the linear memory. And then JavaScript code can pull those numbers out and serialize them into something that can be sent to the space. Let's look more closely at the JavaScript side of things. Let's see how it pulls data out of the memory and uses it. If you're getting into the nitty gritty of this, if you're doing things the hard way and not using any libraries, then you're going to be working directly with this linear memory. And this linear memory is just one big line of ones and zeros. When you want to create meaning from this line of ones and zeros, you have to figure out how to split them up. To do this, you create a typed array view on the array buffer. And basically, this just tells JavaScript how to break up the bits in this array buffer. It's basically like drawing boxes around the bits to say which bits belong to which number. For example, if you were using hexadecimal values, then your numbers would be 42 bits wide. So you need a box that could fit at least 40, uh, sorry. <laughs> if you're using hexadecimal values, then your numbers would be 24 bits wide. <laughs> so you need a box that can fit at least 24 bits. And each box would contain a pixel. The smallest box that fits those 24 bits is 32 bits wide. So we would create a uint32 view on the buffer. And that would wrap the bits up in boxes. In this case, we'd have to add a little padding to fill it out. I'm not showing that, but there would be some extra zeros in here. In contrast, if we use RGB values, the boxes would only be eight bits wide. And we would take every three boxes and use those as our R, G, and B values. Then you would iterate over the boxes and pull out the numbers and move the data around into some more sensible data structures. For a project like this, that's not too bad, because, because colors map very well to numbers, and we don't have very complex data structures here. We just have the R, G, and the B. But when you start getting more complex data structures, having to deal with memory this directly can be a big pain. The reason that you have to deal with memory so directly with WebAssembly right now, the reason that you can't just pass an object from JavaScript into WebAssembly and have WebAssembly change properties and values on it and then give that object back is because WebAssembly doesn't yet have direct access to JavaScript objects or the DOM. That is in the works. The WebAssembly community group is working on specifying that. But just because that isn't here yet, that doesn't mean that you have to wait before you can start working with objects. You don't have to wait. You can pass objects into your WebAssembly and get objects back from your JavaScript. To do this, you can use a library that gives you this nicer API. This library is called WASM BindGen. It wraps the WebAssembly module in a JavaScript wrapper. And this wrapper knows how to take complex JavaScript objects and write them into linear memory. And when the WebAssembly function returns a value, the JS wrapper can take data from linear memory and turn it back into a JS object. To do this, it looks at function signatures in your Rust code and figures out exactly what kind of JavaScript wrapper is needed. This works for built-in types like strings, and it also works for types that you define in your code. WASM BindGen will take the Rust structs and turn them into JavaScript, ob uh, JavaScript classes. Right now, this tool is specific to Rust. But with the way that it's architected, we can add support for this kind of higher level interaction for other languages, languages like C and C++. There's a session that will cover the basics of Rust and some of these other topics like WASM BindGen and WASM Pack, which you can use to package up your WASM modules to go up on NPM. And this session will be tomorrow at the Mozilla booth starting at 13.30 at 1.30 PM. So hopefully now you can see how to take control of this space. 
and how you can say hello to the world and hello to the world of WebAssembly. Before I wrap this up, I do want to give credit to the people that made this project possible. The seeds for the idea of this project came from a dance party that I attended in Pittsburgh that had a space like this. But the project was only possible because of the amazing group of people that gathered to make it a reality. So I want to say thank you to Sandra Persing. I came to her with a vision, and she made that vision real. Uh, I want, also want to say thank you to Dan Brown and Maciej Pluta, who took that vision and turned it into something even more exciting and engaging than I had imagined. And to Till Schneiderite, who helped me figure out how to bring all of these different pieces together. Josh Marinacci, who created the site and made taking control of the space possible. Dan Callahan, who you also saw in that video, uh, he jumped in with his debugging and development wizardry to ensure all of the pieces work together. Trevor F. Smith, who created the virtual space so that everybody can experience this, even if they aren't here at the event. Uh, also, Michael Bebanita and Yuri Delendek, whose work on WebAssembly Studio makes it possible to share WebAssembly with a whole new audience. Rustation's Alex Crichton, Ashley Williams, Sarah Myers, Yanni Ark Rediger, Florian Gilcher, Steve Klabnik, Fabian and Flocky, who worked on WebAssembly Studio's Rust integration and helped aspiring Rust developers level up their skills. The JSConf EU team for all of their hard work in making sure that this installation could get off the ground. And of course, Ian Brill, the artist whose work inspired this project and whose hard work ensured that we could share it with you. Thank you. And now let's party.